receive. But the thing that we need to understand is, first off, that it's not our money, it's whose money. God. So the money that is limited in my bank account right now is not my money. Because God's money have to get that. Got it? But there becomes a problem. You got it? When we receive money, especially in American cultures, there becomes these things called worries and anxiety with money. And we're going to be talking about problems with loving money. And we're going to turn to a passage right now. Called, it's in Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 19. So if you have a Bible, which you should because it's yellow in near you. By the way, if this is your very first time and you do not have a Bible, that yellow Bible is yours to keep. Yours to keep. Randy, when you find it, let me know. Or Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. Find Matthew chapter 6 for me. 672 in the yellow Bibles. You got it? We're going to be talking about problems with loving money. Now, how many of you guys, you know what, you would like to have more money, honestly. I mean, maybe not loving, but you'd like to have more money. Yeah. I mean, I would like to have more money because, for one, I would like to take care of my family. Two, I would like to take this money and do something great for God. I don't have to be rich to be happy. But in Matthew chapter 6, there's some categories about problems with loving money. And this is, I mean, just I preached these passages before and I brought different aspects to them, but this time it, it hits right on the nose with money. All right, you ready? Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on where? Earth. Where moth and rust and will destroy it. And where thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in where? Heaven. Heaven. Where the moth and rust do not destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. Let's pause there. So what should we do with the money that God does give us? Get back to Him. Get back to Him, okay. What should we do? Not store up treasures where? On earth. But we need to store up treasures in... Okay, here's some illustrations. I mean, it's actually really cool. I was hoping this would happen. It actually did. I was carrying on this box. Don't worry, there's not a real TV in here, and we're not rich. But, all right, it's one of these TVs. And they're beautiful TVs, aren't they? They really are. So we, I was walking out um, from the basement and bringing it in, and probably six people said, Dude, would that fit in my car? I want that TV. That, that's for me. That's for me. And, of course, they were joking, but were they real? I mean, if I would say, okay, here we go, they'd be like, Huh? Yeah, I got a TV at church. That's all good. Church is always asking for money, and I get a TV. But how many of you guys, if I, if I went right now and passed out raffle tickets, how many of you guys would take like three or four raffle tickets and say, I want that TV? How many of you guys? Okay, good, good, good. Now let's think. You have money that God has given you. Okay, Muno has that money that God has given him. All right? And uh, you know what? Uh, a TV would be nice. I mean, this is a, I think these are 46 inch TVs, and uh, they're not uh, full HD, but they're nice TVs. How many of you guys would like one of these TVs in your bedroom? Awesome. Now, let me ask you how many of you, and this is a rhetorical question, would actually let your family suffer in order for you to get a TV? And I pray nobody would. But what this verse is talking about is this. We want the new and best thing. What is ever wrong with, and I'm preaching to myself here, because, dude, I got, a, I got a nice TV, and I'll talk about that in a second. Well, what's wrong with the 27-inch, like, box tube? For one, it's heavy as all get out, but well, what's wrong with having that? Is there anything wrong with having that? No. Will the same TV shows and movies come out of that TV? Yes. Who cares about high definition? And you're like, oh, that's, that's hypocrisy there. Get out of it. It's all about high depth. It's all about wearing the glasses. And woo! That's, like, that's what it's all about. But it's all about the new best thing. And I love the commercial. I should have found it. And I, I just came to my mind. That one about that the, the delivery truck comes up. And it's like, uh, what is it? Like TV number like 3D and everything. And then the, the little kid turning around and said, you got the old one, stupid. You saw the Sonic commercial? Or? Still ahead, yeah, there you go, good, okay, good. All right, but we think about getting the new best thing, don't we? That's storing up treasures in heaven. What could you have done? If you still have the boot tube, all right, 
And, and all of a sudden, you have $600 in your bank account. $600 to get the TV. Could it? But we are so easy to get the TV and not give it to people who are in need that don't even have money to provide for their own family. The new best car. I know this doesn't look like a cool car, but back in the day, this was probably like a pimped out awesome cool car. We want the new best car. Instead of holding on to our car when it has 250 miles on it, and then all the lights and buzzers go off and say, I'm finally dead, buy me a new car. <laughs> we are so ready to trade in our car for the new best thing. We're willing to prolong our loans so that we can have the new best thing. What God is saying in this verse is simply this. Don't store up treasures in heaven, or don't store up treasures here on earth, because what's going to happen to it? What is that? That's mold. This box has been in the basement just for a couple months. It got a little bit wet. If we had left it down there for a little bit longer, mold would have encompassed the entire thing. If I would have left one of these TVs down there, what would have happened to that TV? It would have been what? Destroyed. Your TV, your stereo, your iPod, and those things aren't bad to have. Make sure I preface that. But when you are having money that you could be using for other things, and it becomes a priority, it's not storing up treasures in heaven, it's storing treasures here on earth. And the Bible clearly says not to do so. Got it? All right, who's going to go buy an iPad or an iPad today? All right, Russ, shame on you, we'll talk later on. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's continue in this verse. Um, Matthew chapter 6, 21 through 23, it says, um, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the, is the lamp of the body, and, is eye, and if your eyes are good, the whole body is filled with light. But if the eyes are bad, the whole body is filled with darkness. If then the light within you is, dark, is in darkness... How great is the darkness? Let the verse talk about two things. It talks about the mind and the heart. Where your treasure is there, your what will be also? Heart. And if you talk about the eyes, it's always talking about what you're seeing goes into your brain. Do you think the love of money pollutes your heart and your mind? Absolutely. It really does. Loving and desiring more and more and more and more and more when you could be doing more and more and more stuff for other things, and God causes your heart to have a problem. I remember talking about a TV. Um, I really wanted this. It was a 50 inch from Walmart. It was on clearance and on sale. It was awesome. For an entire week, I, I browsed online. I tried to find all the different deals that were out there. And in my mind, and asked Rachel, I mean, maybe it was two weeks, my mind and my heart was so focused on getting that TV. So focused. I went into the kid, this is not true, but just joking. Went to the kid's piggy bank and dumped out all their change. I wanted that TV so bad. And, and it just overwhelmed me, didn't it? And this is a bitter topic between us because she wanted the boob too. Um, and I brought, long story short, without asking her, heart issue. And that's a mind issue, too, because I should have asked her. Ooh, I should have thought, but it controlled me. All right, so I went, and I, and I got a TV. Now, now, when I say TV, it could be any material things, okay? But this is just an illustration. But I, I went to Wally World, and I got my TV, and I said, Rachel, I'm going to borrow the van, um, and I did. I had to rip up all the box and everything so it fits in the back, because I wasn't going to call my father-in-law. I wasn't going to call my, anybody to help me with this TV that I could not afford. Threw it in the back of the van. Pulled up and said, hey, Rachel, check it out what I have. Then she came out and she's like, no, you didn't. I, I, I almost, I think the like, almost exact word, no, you didn't. And even to today, it's, it's a bitter topic between us. She likes the TV. But would she have liked to have money and do savings or money to do more things? Absolutely. And shame on me for allowing it to overtake my heart overtake my mind and that's what the love of money will do if we are not careful about it got it all right and now let's go to continue a little bit and this next one is really cool um 
is Matthew, and this is this is probably the toughest one in the world. Matthew chapter six and verse twenty-four. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. No one can serve both God and money. And I'm here to tell you that many of you guys are slaves to money right now. And here's an example of it. Go to throw the video over there. I'm Stanley Johnson. I've got a great family. I've got a four-bedroom house in a great community. Like my car? It's new. I even belong to the local golf club. And how do I do it? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I can barely pay my finance charges. Somebody help me. <laughs> I think that's where we are. Well, we're like, someone help, I'm going to deck to my eyeballs in order for me to get the pimped out TV and the iPhone or anything that's just material that you just don't need, but you what? What? You want that stuff, but you necessarily don't need it. What ends up happening? You go to the bank and you say, check it out, bank. This is my information. Um, I know I have three or four other loans because of that issue, that issue, that issue. And we become slaves to the money because of the stuff that we want, not need. God will take care of all the needs that you have because whose money actually is it? God's money. All right? It says no one can serve two masters. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve money and everything that goes around with money. Got it? Got it? But it leads to this final thing. Having material things and loving material things, being a slave to it, and, and all the other things that we just talked about that just completely messes up with our heart and mind leads, leads to one word. That word starts with W. And what is it? Worry. How am I going to pay my, my bills? How am I going to pay for my family? Because I've got all these bills racked up. Now I understand I'm not lumping everybody's bills into one because there are circumstances that come up that maybe it's a medical issue that you've been in the hospital for three and a half years and you just got like two million dollars worth of debt of and that's 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 different. That's a little bit different, but you're still slaves to it. What ends up happening is when it's just material things and things that you get that you want. That causes you to worry. How many of you guys are I can honestly say that you're a little worried about finances right now? Alright. If you don't have your hand up, it might be you. Alright? In verse 25, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, this is what God says about worry. It says, what is the very first word there? Therefore. Whenever the Bible says therefore, you need to find out why it is there. Four. Okay, okay. Let me repeat that. It's just it's like a Bible lesson right here. Whenever the Bible says therefore, we need to find out why it is therefore. Okay. And it says therefore because it just talked about all this money and being slaves, being the stores of treasures in heaven. And it talked about all this. And then it says therefore. It just said all this stuff. And Jesus said all this stuff. It says therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you'll eat or drink, or what you're, or about your body, and what you'll wear. It is not life more important than food, and body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or weep, nor store up any treasures in their barns. And yet, your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you who of you, by worry, can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God closes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire... Will not he much more clothe you, O oh, ye of little what? Faith. We are worried about money. I am worried about money. I'm, I'm the only 
if you want to call a staff person here at the church. And sometimes I get worried about the finances of the church. I, I do, and I get worried about how I'm going to take care of my family. It just kind of overwhelms me. But what does the Bible say I should not do? I should not worry about money. And that's a battle that I have faced many, many times. It costs roughly about $1,500 a week to make Catalyst Church be the church it is. And by the way, I don't receive a penny of that. I'm not paid here at the church. But what I do is we look at the tithe and we're like, how are we going to survive? And God, John, the truth. We moved into this building. Um, and some of the, many of you guys who came from the hotel over here, um, you, you knew the God story. Basically, God gave us this building for about $1,500 a month. And the retail value of this place is about $3,000 a month. I worried and worried still about how we're going to pay the $1,500. Not once. Not once. Not a single time has God failed us as the church. Man. The lights are still on. The air conditioner is kind of cool. And we still have a church. Because people have been obedient. And God has not failed. Not one time. So why should I worry? But I do. Shame on me for worry. Personal finances too. I don't know how Rachel and I honestly don't know right now how we are going to pay September's bills. We don't. We really, we seriously don't. My bus driving thing, I don't get paid until a certain time. That's not going to be enough time. And I'm like, how is it going to work? We sit down and budget and it's like, it's not going to work. Not a single time in my lifetime by giving to God, giving back to the church, I have not once, not once, been able to feed my family. Not once been able to put clothes on my kids' back. Not once have been able to pay the mortgage or the rent. Not one time. So why should I worry about this next month of the church? Why should I? I shouldn't. But it's human nature too. And Guy clearly talks about this. Um, so what do we do with money? Okay, so we got the idea of, you got the concept that money can control us. You got that idea? You got the idea that just money just kind of overwhelms our heart and our mind, and we should not worry, but we do, right? We got that idea? Okay, all right, here we go. So what do we do with our money? Luna, come back up here. Yeah. <laughs> now let me, let me count that for a second. You got $10 still there? Okay, very good. I got you. Okay, bad illustration. <laughs> But before we do this, Muno, we're going to watch this video with everybody uh, talking about this, this word called tithing. Right? Oh, it's the money message. Give to God. Give to the church. It's whose money? God. Then shut up and watch the video. <laughs> Okay? I mean, you really think he expects something back? Now, I know there's a lot of people at church that would not understand this line of reasoning. That's why, just to make things simple and not to cause any controversy, I like to carry what I call the little empty envelope. Alright? You see, when the plate gets passed, I whoop, put it in there like that. The deacons counting the money. They only know me as the crazy empty envelope guy, but the people sitting around me, clueless. <laughs> I win, they win, God wins. No one gets hurt because no one knows. God knows. Huh? I only agree to make this video if they promise not to tell you who I am. I mean, it's really none of your business. And it's also none of your business how much I give. I'm not going to brag about it, okay? I mean, yeah, it's cool. I just got married and I have a kid, okay? And sure, you know, we get around. We're doing okay. But look, who I am and what I give is it's between God and I, okay? I mean, the sacrifices I make are between me and God, and my reward is in heaven. So look, don't try to figure out who I am or what I give, because honestly, it's, it's none of your business. I tell you. But just not like in the form of a 10% check per se. Let me tell you what I mean. When I go to church on a Sunday morning, they're selling donuts, I buy some. Boom, that's a tie. When my whole Sunday school class wants donuts, and I have the goodness of my heart buy a whole bunch for the Sunday school class, boom, that's another tie. But it's not 
about me spending money. It's about the smile on people's faces. That, my friends, is time enough for me. Case in point, the church was having date nights where we could take our spouse out for an evening, and they were charging $25 for child care. Boom, shaka, laka, tithe. I'll tell you what the biggest tithe was. I spent over $100 on our meal, and my wife was bringing ear to ear. That, my friends, a tithe. I, I would like to give. I would, okay, but everything right now is just crazy. I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, real crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would I would consider giving something, but not, now it's crazy. We're, we're, we're gonna give later, we've already talked about it. I mean, down the road we'll be crazy givers, but right now it's just crazy. Uh. Yeah, I have money, that's a fact. But you know what? It's a hard thing between me and the Lord and the pastor because he needs to know what I'm giving now that we have this little building campaign going on, if you know what I'm saying. And pastor, I'd give a little bit more. I'd give a little something, something if you'd have that music ministry, sing a couple more hymns now and then. Huh? Hey, what's this? What's this? Is that a Benjamin? I think it is. Benji likes hymns. Come on, you want it? Come on, pastor, do what I say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> In Malachi 3, all right, in verse 8, it says, Will a man rob God? Let me ask you, are you willing to rob God? No, you wouldn't. Okay, actually, no. Yet, you rob him. No, thank you for asking. And then it says, but you ask. That's good. How do we rob you? That's what the Bible says. That's good. No, you know your scripture. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, okay. Okay. God answers this. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. The whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Not just individuals, but the whole what? Nation. Sounds familiar? Just leave it that. No political statement there. Because you are robbing me, bring the whole tithe. What is a tithe? What percentage is a tithe? 10%. Alright? Bring the whole 10% tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my who's talking here god that there may be food in my house and then it says test me in this say the lord almighty uh, says the lord almighty and see if i do not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it muna that is my money, God. That's my money. Got it, got it, got it. You're robbing me right now. No, I, didn't, I, I really don't. I really don't want it all back. It's kind of like I'm a, I'm a bank too. And so I've got I've got unlimited money. The I say the Bible says that I own the cattle upon a thousand hills. I, I have more money than you know what to do with, and I'm giving you a portion of my money because I'm investing in you, my child. <coughs> but you don't have to pay me any of that back. But I have an investment proposition for you. You ready for this? I, I've got an investment proposition. And it'll just take 10%. Okay, of my, of my money, right? Just, just 10%. The proposition is this. I want to further my kingdom. God wants to further his kingdom. I've got a message. God's got a message that... It will go to every single ear. And the message is a life-changing message. Not only is there a message, there are needy people in the, in the world. And, and you know what? Real religion is simply taking care of the poor and the widow and the orphans. And, and, you know, my heart goes out for those people who do, not have, who do not have the resources. And according to my word, as I just read, is you need to bring it into the storehouse which is the church. 
the filter of that is you need to give 10% of my money back to God <coughs> through the filter of the church. Pause right there. When the Bible talks about 10% in the storehouse, back then they didn't have cash. They mainly gave their, their harvest and they gave their supplies. And they just said, God said, hey, 10%, just give 10%. So that, and the purpose was, Cliff notes is this. The 10%, actually, the Israelite people were really giving more than 10%, but the 10% of God's is simply this. 1% go, went to the Le Levitical priest, in other words, to the pastor. All right. The other 9% went to the church to allow God's work to continue. And he just asked for 10%. That's where the 10% storehouse comes from. Does that, you make, that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, okay, go back to our story. Go back to God. Okay. You're robbing me right now. I'm asking for just 10% back. In order for you, Muno, not to rob me, how much do you think you want to invest back into me? Just one dollar. 10%. But it's your choice. You could do the following, Muno. You can give me a dollar. All right? All right? Okay, exactly. All right? And I promise you, because you did this, this one dollar, this 10%, will be used to further my kingdom. But as my child, I will take care of you with only 90%. I guarantee you that 90% right there will take care of all your needs, not your wants. This. I believe that this 10% here, out of your income, there would not be a single, if all Christ followers of the entire world will give just 10%. And you're like, hey, my 10% is small. I want to read you a passage. It's in Mark. It's in Mark chapter, it's in Mark chapter 12, if you want to follow along with me real quick. I know that I got you up here for a little bit, but I want you to, you're, you're like, hey, my 10% is just, what's that? 74 in the Bible. What's that? 704. Check this out, check this out. Jesus sat down Opposite of the place where the offerings, basically where they were dropping in their tithes and offerings, um, where it put in and watched the crowd putting in their money into the temple treasury. Many rich threw in large amounts. All right? They were tithing. They were giving to the church, but in large amounts. And by the way, if you're a large giver, continue to give. But this is for those of you who think that you, you cannot give 10% because it's just a little bit. Check this out. But a poor widow came in and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Now, this is Jesus. This is God saying this. I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth but she gave out of her poverty by putting in everything that she had to live on. No, no matter what, and this applies to us all, no matter if this equals to be a really, you make $100 a week and you only give $10. It's worth more to God than the ones who give a lot. Now, don't get me wrong. If you give a lot, still give a lot. Okay. <laughs> but all that to say is, guys, this is obedience. And as God, I guarantee you, if he just takes care of his needs with that money, it'll be all right. Because now you're worried. You're like, nah, I, would you like this back? Oh, good. good. Because <laughs> now, you know, you are not robbing me. Because you've been obedient, it's the church's responsibility to use this for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not to build mega churches, not to make the pastor rich, 
but to use this to further the kingdom of God. Isn't that a great investment? Absolutely. So don't worry. Because you know what? It'll always come back. Rachel reminded me of a story last, last, um, and uh, uh, we're not at prosperity. Hey, you give your 10%, God will give you a million dollars. We're far from that. Because he'll uh, supply all your what? Needs. Needs. Not your wants. But here's a cool story. We didn't have much money. We, 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 we paid our tithe, but then there's something called an offering. Tithe is 10%. An offering is above and beyond your, above, above and beyond your 10%. That's your offering. All right? We gave an offering. We, we, we didn't have much money, but we gave. We felt like God wanted us to give $100 to, to do you remember what it was? Okay, just to give it to something. And this is not to pat us on the back. This is just to say God is, 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 is worthy and he, he takes care of it. We gave our $100 to this, this mission project or whatever, whatever it was. God's on the truth. Rachel reminded me of this last night. We received a check spontaneously for $1,000 in a couple weeks. God paid back the 10%. I'm not saying he's going to always do that. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's going to make you rich. I'm going to say he's going to take care of all your needs. And then though, since I love you, my child, that's yours to keep. Thank you, sir. No, it's yours. All right? Now, when the offering bucket comes by, what are you going to put in there? No, you're going to put $1 in because that's enough. I put $1 in. There you go. Oh, there you go. All right. Let's give Bruno a hand real quick. The simple is this. The verse simply says test him. The entire Bible doesn't say anywhere about testing. Testing, testing, testing. And we are so focused on so much other material things that I want to challenge you is this. Here's the challenge. Go throw it up there. Actually, put up that verse. It says, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so many bless so much blessings that you will have have no you will not have room for enough for it. That blessings word can be misdrewed into being rich. No. No, 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 no. The truth of the matter is, I'm blessed to have a healthy family. I'm blessed to have a house to live on. I'm blessed to have this $5 shirt that I got at Kohl's yesterday. I'm blessed. Rachel and I have never been a one. Here's our tithe check. You can ask anybody here that counts the money. We give. Not because of compulsion, but because we want to give. And that's the same thing applies to check this out. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So just because I preach a message does not mean I'm twisting your arms and you need to give and you're leaving. That's another one of those churches that are asking for my money. No. The church is not asking for your money. God's asking for just a little bit of his money back to further his kingdom. Muna, in this illustration, was a child of God. If you're in this room and you are not a child of God, this illustration does not work. Because God takes care of his what? Let me ask you. If you were to die today, would you open up your eyes and look at God and say, you know what? God, I've been good. I've given to the church. I've taken care of widows and orphans. I've done all that stuff. And God will look at you and say, thank you very much. But for some reason, I don't know you because you don't know Jesus. So let me ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Which means you are the child of God. And that might overwhelm you. It's simply this. You admit that you're a sinner. Do you believe that Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth to die for you and for me? Do you, do you believe that? And are you ready to take that step 